Well, Valdemar Schudde, seen here on the left, was formerly the home of Prince Eugen of Sweden, who was born in 1865. And Valdemar Schudde, with his collections, was bequeathed to the Swedish state on the prince's death in 1947 and opened as a public museum the following year. Uh, the donor, Prince Eugen, was the son of Oscar II of Sweden and had studied art in Paris for, amongst others, Leon Bonnat between 1887 and 1889. Uh, Prince Eugen uh, was not only a painter of repute, he was also a major art collector, and the collections at Valdemar Schudde comprise about uh, 3,000 works by more than 400 artists. In addition to this, there are around 1,000 applied art and design objects, and 3,000 3, works by the prince himself, of which around 800 are oil paintings. And here is uh, just a cross-section of what we have in our uh, collections. He, the prince didn't know, only donate his home and the gallery building, but also all the uh, collections and also furniture and so on. Um, a characteristic of private as well as public uh, art collections in Sweden from the 19th and early 20th centuries is that the number of works by female artists is very marginal. And the Valdemar Schudde collection is no exception and only contains around 4% of works by women artists. Um, this percentage is, of course, very low, but there are major Swedish collections from the same period that contain no or only a few works by women. Uh, from the 1880s, when the prince started to collect, and some decades on, uh, very few works by women artists were acquired by him. But from the 1920s, one can notice an increase in the acquisitions. Uh, women artists are, however, to a large extent represented by drawings, pastels and watercolours, as can be seen here with the three works by, from the left. Uh, Hanna Hirsch Pauli has made that uh, a drawing. And uh, underneath is Elisabeth Bergstrand Paulsen. Uh, I think it's a, a watercolour. And then Katti Norgren on the right there. But there are also major... Um, works in the, com in the collections. Um, there are also uh, important works by women artists in the collections, and here are two such uh, works. Uh, on the left is Hanna Hirsch Pauli's portrait of her husband-to-be painter, Georg Pauli, and on the uh, right is uh, Vera Nilsson's The First Step portrait of her daughter. Um, since Valdemar Schudde became a museum in 1948, uh, major works have been donated to the museum, for which we are very grateful, since the museum has no funds for acquisitions. And the paintings shown here are uh, Sigrid Jatien's flag parade uh, from 1914 on the left, uh, Magdalena by Eva Bonnier, painted in 1887, and Mina Karlsson's self-portrait from 89. And they have all entered the collections as donations. And these and other generous gifts have increased the number of works by women artists in the collection somewhat. Uh, but we also feel that we have to be more proactive in decreasing the gender gap. And so we are fortunate to have uh, friends of the Museum Association, and they have recently agreed to fund acquisitions of art by female artists starting this year. And the aim is to complement the collections with works by women artists uh, that fall within the time limits of the Prince's collection, which is works uh, painted roughly between the 1880s and 1940s. Um, but as the acquisition of works by women artists is a long-term project, Valdemar Schudde has, for a number of years, used other strategies in order to increase the visibility of women artists. Um, the exhibition policy of Valdemar Schudde since the directorship of Karin Sidian from 2012 has a clear gender focus, and the museum works proactively to have gender parity in its exhibitions. And these exhibitions fall into three main types, of which solo exhibitions featuring contemporary artists, as well as those born in the 19th, late 19th and early 20th centuries is one. And here is a selection of recent solo exhibitions with women, ex uh, with women um, artists. Uh, but our focus on increasing the visibility of women artists in exhibitions is to a large extent on collective exhibitions. 
and uh, another exhibition category is late 19th and early, early 20th century art movements. And today we have focused on symbolism, academic salon painting, plein air painting, and early modernism. And by including forgotten or less well-known female artists and by highlighting their contribution to the art of the different periods, we have been able to contribute in the rewriting of Swedish art history. Uh, the catalogues that accompany the exhibitions are research-based and contain articles by experts in their respective fields from universities, other museums and institutions, as well as contributions from the Valdemarsjöde staff. And here are some photos from the Valdemarsjöde exhibition, Symbolism and Decadence, from 2015, featuring a wall with drawings and graphic art by the previously little-known Tyra Kleen, and to the left, in the glass cabinet, fine art objects by Agnes de Frimeri. The exhibition sparked an interest in both artists and the work of Tyra Kleen has since been shown in several group and solo exhibitions in Sweden. Exploring the influence of French modernist painters Henri Matisse and Henri Lott on a large number of Swedish painters has resulted in two exhibitions and the aim of these exhibitions has been to present forgotten or little known artists and many of these were women. The Inspiration Matisse exhibition will be presented in more detail further on in this presentation. Um, in 2017, we investigated the influence of modern, moderate cubist André Lott, who, from the 1910s through to the 60s, taught more than 200 Swedish artists out of a total of some 2,000 students from all over the world. And we uh, initially had a list of 140 names of Lord students from a 1970s essay by art historian Anna-Lena Lindberg. And uh, in the process of trying to locate works by these artists, we were able to add a number of names to this list. And the artists worked in different media, such as painting, sculpture, fabric design, photography, art glass, ceramics, and theatre set design and around 40% of the Lord's, of Lord's Swedish students were women. The Valdemarsjöde exhibition was the first of its kind in highlighting the importance of André Lott as a teacher and his influence um, on several generations of painter from, painters from Sweden. The exhibitions and catalogue have inspired similar exhibitions that are now being planned in other parts of the world. Um, in recent years, the museum has conducted a long-term exhibition project focusing on artist colonies uh, around the turn of the century 1900 uh, and uh, has so far mounted shows on Skagen in Denmark, Tyresö in Sweden, Vorpsved in Germany and Gresula in France. New research has been presented in the accompanying catalogues and we have paid special attention to lifting female members of the colonies and finding ways of letting their voices be heard through letters, interviews, memoirs, etc. The Skagen exhibition also featured a contemporary comment in Annika Carlson Rickson's Annika by the Sea, and her paraphrases on uh, Severin Kreur's painting Hip Hip Hooray. These works had a distinct gender perspective in highlighting the networks of female rather than male artists and were shown in dialogue with those of the Skagen painters, and it's Annika Rickson here on the on the left, on the right, sorry. These exhibitions and our stated ambition to work for gender, par gender parity uh, were a contributing factor to Valdemarsjöde being named Swedish Museum of the Year in 2017. We intend to carry on our investigative exhibitions with a focus on gender and to keep exhibiting women artists, as well as con to continue to look at perspectives of re on reception and representation from a gender point of view. And as mentioned before, this week we opened a major exhibition with works by famous contemporary artist Lena Kronqvist, who in her art investigates gender issues through her many depictions of girls. And here is a cropped image of her painting, The Mother. Uh, uh, I have worked with the majority of the above mentioned exhibition, collective exhibitions and I will give examples on how we uh, went about uh, creating these and what our objectives were. And to illustrate this, I have chosen uh, three exhibitions to describe a little bit more in depth. 
And first I will just briefly talk about the situation vis-à-vis -vis exhibitions that the Swedish women uh, faced in the late 18th and early 20th centuries. And this photo here is um, from uh, the studio of May Bring, who was in Paris around 1910. Uh, and she, she is the person on the left there pouring tea uh, to her friends who were also her fellow students at the Académie Matisse around 1909. Uh, in Paris, the women were able to exhibit their works, but when they returned to Sweden, they could not do so if they did not belong to an art association. And the most powerful and influential association at the time, Konstnärsförbundet, the Artists' Union, was not keen on female members. And when women were able to show their works, the exhibitions were often only reviewed in women's magazines and museums and collectors ignored them. Uh, in 1910, women painters formed their own association, Föreningen Svenska Konstnärinnor, in order to be allowed to exhibit their works. The first exhibition took place in 1911. It had two sections, one contemporary and one retrospective, Mina Karlsson Bredberg, uh, on the right here, uh, organized uh, the retrospective section, which contained 55 artists. Um, the exhibition featured a total of 660 um, works by 179 artists, and is to this day the biggest manifestation of works by female artists that has ever been shown in Sweden. Back then, single gender exhibitions were the only way forward for these women. Ida Schultzenheim, on the left, um, who was a, a founding member of the association, she actually initiated it, knew that it was not ideal to have all women shows, but she remarked that circumstances forced the women to do this. Uh, and, and I'll talk about three of the collective exhibitions that I have worked with. The first was Inspiration Matisse, shown in 2014. Um, when we planned the show, one of the aims was to broaden the general understanding of the Swedish art history term Matisse Elever, Matisse students, which is commonly used when referring to four Swedish artists, three male and one female, who attended Henri Matisse's school. From the start of the project, we decided to include Norwegian Matisse students as well. And of course, we knew that other Swedish artists than those four had studied for Matisse, but we were surprised as we began to research the matter to find that Matisse had had as many as 40-odd Swedish and Norwegian students, and that seven of these had been women, all of them Swedish. Uh, our aim was to include works by as many of these women as possible, uh, one source for our research was Norwegian art historian Marit Werenskjold's De Norske Matisse Eleverna, Læretid och Genombrud, Norwegian Matisse Students' Apprenticeship and Breakthrough from 1972, which also contained a list of Swedish Matisse students. And here is a picture from the main gallery hall at Valdemarsjöde with the Inspiration Matisse exhibition, and centered on the wall is Sigrid Jertjens Atelier Interieur, Studio Interior from 1916, uh, that belongs to the Stockholm Modern Museum. And Jatien is, of course, today regarded as one of Sweden's foremost modernists. The exhibition photo is uh, from one of the gallery halls where we had hung male and uh, uh, female nude studies from Matisse's school uh, side by side uh, to allow visitors to get a first-hand account of what it was like to study at Matisse's school. We also had an audio track with an interview with my bring that could be listened to through the headphones. Uh, these are two paintings by Molly Faustmann, two sisters in Paris and a view uh, on, of um, the old town. Uh, sorry, it's uh, Molly Faustmann on the left, two sisters in Paris, and my bring on the right, a view from the old town. Uh, to try to somewhat address the gender imbalance, since less than 20% of the Matisse students had been women, we decided to include, when possible, several works by each woman artist in the exhibition in order to let them make more of an impact. It was initially hard to find works by the women, uh, except for by Sigrid Jatien. Some paintings by the other, other women artists were found through auction sites and in provincial art institutions. In one case, relatives of one of the artists contacted us and they also had works. 
We were also lucky to find private collectors of works by Mai Bring and Molly Faustmann. In the end, we exhibited 34 paintings by women artists out of a total 123 paintings, so around 25% of the works shown were by women. In the catalogue, we uh, compiled short biographies for each artist. Biographical data was hard to come by for several of the women and had to be gathered from, for instance, newspaper articles and old exhibition catalogues. Uh, another source was the Encyclopedia Svensk Konstnärs Lexicon, published between 1952 and 1967, which has short entries on 12,000 Swedish artists and, somewhat surprisingly, many women among them. Uh, we were, of course, aware of the fact that women artists and their works were often belittled and made fun of in exhibition reviews. But we were still shocked when we read some of the re reviews of a 1921 exhibition at Liljevalk Gallery. Shocked at the spite and derision and malice that the reviewers expressed, and also appalled by the fact that the women were targeted for their gender. So on one wall in the exhibition, we hung some of the works that had been particularly savagely reviewed, and the paintings were accompanied by quotations from the reviews. And here are two paintings by Millie Slör, she was one of those especially targeted by the reviewers, and partly because of her unusual painting technique that you can see in those, these two paintings. And sometime uh, after the 1921 exhibition, she began to suffer from mental ill health, and she was not the only woman artist to do so in consequence of extreme and derogatory criticism. The second exhibition I want to talk about is our 2014 exhibition, The Magic of Light, plein air painting from the late 19th century. The aim, again, was to have gender parity, but at the start of the project we were not sure that we would reach our goal, because com comparatively we knew of so few women artists from the period. Most of the standard Swedish art histories mention no or very few women artists from between the 1870s to 1900. Uh, which was the time span of our exhibition. Fortunately, there was one publication that was very useful to us, Kvinna och konstnär i 1800-talet Sverige, a woman and artist in 19th century Sweden by Barbro Verkmester and Eva-Lena Bengtsson, which mentioned uh, many women artists, and uh, quite a few of them had works depicted too. Uh, and we used this source, as well as searching various art museum databases and letter archives, going through auction house catalogues, newspaper articles, and old exhibition catalogues, in addition to reading artists' biographies and other printed matter. We unearthed a number of new names, and in several cases found that relatives of the women painters still owned a number of their paintings. And on the wall here, you see in the center of the uh, main gallery hall is um, uh, Gerda Roosevelt Kalstenius uh, portrait of uh, or painting of uh, washerwomen uh, in Stockholm, and the paintings. Uh, the painting is flanked by, uh, on the left, paintings by Elisabeth Warling, and on the right, uh, Charlotte Wallström, two painters who had n not been at all known or and hardly mentioned in art history earlier. Uh, these two paintings are by Anna Nordgren, uh, by the River and Willows are their titles. Uh, the painter Anna Nordgren was a point in case where a relative still owns a great number of her paintings. Nordgren had been extremely successful as a painter in London and in Paris in the 1880s and 90s and, 90s and was able to live very comfortably on what she made as an artist. Of her generation, she was one of Sweden's most successful artists internationally, regardless of gender. Uh, the fact is unfortunately uh, not mirrored in the holdings of the Swedish National Museum, uh, which includes only four paintings by Anna Nogren, of which three were acquired recently. In comparison, the museum holds 35 oil paintings by one of the leaders of Konstnärsförbundet and 25 by another. We were happy in our exhibition to be able to show eight works of Anna Nordgren. So this is the East Hall of Valdemar Schudde. Um, as well as wanting to introduce the general public to lost women, we also wanted to include lost men in the exhibition and to challenge the pre prevalent art history canon. This has been shaped by Konstnärsförbundet, the Artists' Association, 
a group of male artists who dominated the Swedish art scene between approximately 1890 and 1920. In an epic two-tone publication about the association, it was their history that was told, and this became the only known history of the entire period. It was as if the women and men who did not belong to the association had never existed. As the association had strict rules for joining and for remaining a member, very few women met the required criteria, and one who did, Sophie Schoenstedt, who had success successfully exhibited in London and Paris, was arbitrarily told that her works were too neo-impressionistic for her to join. And in this hall here, we have hung male and female paintings together. Uh, as we unearthed more and more female artists and their works, we had to start excluding artists and decided that it would be the male artists who would have to make way. The exhibition would have a reverse perspective in that uh, there would be more women than men represented. In the end, we showed 146 works by 46 women and 54 works by 40 men. Over 60% of the works by the women artists were in private ownership. And here you can see in the middle, there is a painting by uh, Ida Gisikospark, uh, an artist that very little is known about. And she is flanked by the far left by a painting by Julia Beck, and on the far right, a painting by Mimi Setterström, uh, all of them in private ownership. Um, and this is the West Gallery with uh, um, um, Hanna Paulis' uh, uh, Time for Breakfast, Frukostax, in the centre. Um, as painting by women artists are often smaller in size than those of men, we decided to not exhibit two large canvases by male artists. Also, with very few exceptions, the paintings on show by the women had not been shown public at all or a very long time ago and were therefore not familiar to the general public. We therefore decided to show paintings of the same status by um, show that, that we showed the male and female paintings together. And finally, I want to say a few words about our exhibition in, uh, 20, uh, in 2019, last year, uh, that uh, focused on uh, the artist colony at Cré sur Loin. Here we wanted to um, uh, partly uh, paint a different picture of the well-known artist colony that uh, existed in the 1880s and early 1890s in France. Uh, in Sweden, uh, this colony is mostly known for being the place where a very famous Swedish artist, Carl Larsson, discovered watercolour painting. Uh, in our exhibition, Carl Larsson, Carl Nordström and all the other well-known male grey artists were of course represented, uh, but it was Julia Beck we showed the most works by and whom we uh, presented as one of the colony's leading artists. At the same time, we also presented Grey as an international and not only Swedish artist colony and focused on the contacts between the Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon artists and for the first time, their works were shown together. Uh, the Swedish-Canadian couple, Carolina Benedix, who was a sculptor, and William Blair Bruce, who was a painter, and uh, who first, they, the couple first met in Grey, they became a symbol of these transnational relations. Uh, in the above-mentioned exhibitions, we have sought uh, out unjustly neglected female artists and made great efforts to find representative works by them. And through these exhibitions, a large number of women artists whose names had previously been little known or unknown have been introduced to museum visitors. It is our hope that the exhibitions have helped bring an awareness to the general public and maybe also to Swedish art historians uh, of alternative art histories that exist next to the long-established male narratives. And now I will uh, read Karina's presentation. Um, for the winter of 2021-22, we are planning an exhibition entitled A Room of One's Own, dealing with the changing role of the artist in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The exhibition departs from a dissertation project uh, by Karina Resch that has conducted that uh, at Stockholm that has been conducted at Stockholm University since 2016. 
The purpose of Karina's thesis is to anal analyze how Nordic women painters negotiate professional identity in painting during the 1880s, and the focus is on self-portraits, friendship images, and studio interiors. The thesis discusses how artistic identities formed and per performed autoreflexive auto-reflexively in relation to the self, but more importantly, in dialogue with a colleague through identification, a sense of community, and artistic collaboration. Finally, the dissertation aims at highlighting the import importance of the studio as a constitutive place, space sorry, for artistic professionalism, studying how women painters interact with and stage themselves and one another in the studio space. The dissertation is the first academic study that focuses on Nordic women painters' self-representation and collaborative portraits in the late 19th century in comparative perspective, and the, look, and the only book-length study on the studio interior in Nordic art. Um, throughout the last four years, Karina has conducted archival research in Sweden, Norway and Denmark, and has been able to locate comprehensive unpublished archival material, and in particular the private correspondence of the artists Hildegard Turell, Janna Bauk, Berta Wegman, and Asta Nörregård, Venny Soldan Brofelt, and Hanna Hirsch Pauli. Based on this correspondence and the artist epistolary practice, we can better understand the importance of companionship and collaboration for the establishment of a collective identity. In this context, the thesis argues that friendship images, this means portraits and interiors in which the artists employ one another as models, have played a pivotal role in the construction of a professional identity. They can be understood as mediated self-representations by means of which the artists were able to stage their multiple identities as artists and women in a period of increasing liberation, professionalization and internationalization. The artist's collaborative project was indeed a professional one and shaped by practical considerations and the economic circumstances. Women traveled together because it was safer and women lived together because it was cheaper. Women artists employed one another as models because their friends were more reliable and would sit for free. These relationships were neither free from friction or conflict and they were at times shaped by rivalry and jealousy. However, in their correspondence, the artists expressed a strong sense of belonging and identification with one another's work. The study of these partnerships and the resulting friendship images allows us to question our understanding of artistic practice as a lonely endeavor and to question conventional narratives surrounding the figure of the artist, such as the lonely genius, the outsider, the one who creates his work in seclusion, free from outer influences, or contribution by others. The exhibition departs from these research questions, but it deliberately employs a broader perspective than the dissertation, as it traces the changing no notions of the artist, the collective and the studio space in the art from the late 19th to early 20th century. The focus is on the Nordic context, and the time span is from 1880 until 1918. Compared to previous centuries where artists were tied to and or the court, this was a period of the exhibition artist who had to brand him or herself just as much as his or her work. The artist was suddenly liberated from traditional ties and dependencies and had to work for a free market and a public audience. Parallel to this phenomenon, we see that the women's movement, women pursuing professional careers, travel abroad abroad and educate themselves at the Academy in Stockholm or in the private academies in Paris. It is quite important for us not to make this an all-woman exhibition, but instead we want to present the above-mentioned women artists uh, in dialogue with their, with their male contemporaries. Artists such as Hugo Birger, Anders Sorn, Christian Krog or Edvard Munch, who have shaped a general understanding of how, of how an artist should look like, behave and be. In the upcoming exhibition, we want to argue that it is important to understand women's artistic practice not as a parallel phenomenon to the dominant narrative. Instead, we want to question and complicate the dominant narrative and shift the angle towards the, woman, uh, the women's perspective. 
For this upcoming project, we are, we are very happy to collaborate with the Hirschsprung Collection in Copenhagen, which is organizing a monographic exhibition on Bertha Wegmann in the spring of 2021. While they focus on the individual artist, we will place Bertha Wegmann's friendship images of Shanna Bauk in a broader context of artistic self-fashioning in the late 19th century. Thank you.